Uh, if you haven't been with us, we've been preaching through the book of Revelation. At least I've been studying it and teaching you what I've learned. I have so much more to learn than I have uh, to say that um, it's a little embarrassing to do that. And yet, I love the fact that you guys are so gracious and are like, yes, let's just learn together and I'll share what I think God's put on my heart. So we're going to look at a couple of verses. I was reading through, I read through the Bible every year. That's my routine. And so I read three to five chapters a day and I hit this chapter this week. And if you're reading the Bible in one year plan, the Nicky Gumbel plan, you probably did too. And I thought that needs to be said and read on Father's Day. So um, that's where I'm going. So I appreciate you indulging me in preaching two sermons today. Um, yes, you can uh, pay me later. Okay, so with that, let's start reading. Now, let me give you quickly the setting and then we'll jump in. So the book of Kings is just what it sounds like. It's historical narrative about the kings of Israel and Judah when they were united as one kingdom and then when they split into the two kingdoms, starting with King Saul, then David, then Solomon, and then things split from there. We are at the stage where David, after 40 years is ruling as king, is about to die, and his son, Solomon, is about to begin his 40-year reign. And so basically what we're looking at here is a, a father's charge to his son in a last word setting. I picture, I don't know if he's in his bed saying this. I don't know if they kind of carry him to the throne room where Solomon has already been um, coronated and anointed and made king or not. We don't get those details, but this is what it says. When the time drew near for David to die, he gave a charge to Solomon, his son. I'm about to go the way of all the earth, he said. So be strong, act like a man, and observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in obedience to him and keep his decrees and commands his laws and regulations as written in the law of Moses. Do this so that you may prosper in all that you do wherever you go and that the Lord may keep his promise to me if your descendants watch how they live and if they walk faithfully before me with all their heart and soul, you will never fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that today as we hear from you through your word, that your spirit will do his great work in our hearts and minds to help us to understand what it says, comprehend what it means, and then find the courage and faith to go live out the implications. Help us trust you in and through that as we rest in you, in Christ's name, amen. Uh, Nikki Gumbel tells another story about a homeless woman who was outside his church in Bristol, England, a lot. And every time people would come by, they, she would harass them for money, and when they declined, she would give them a hard time. This lady dies, and Nikki decides he's going to do the funeral. I don't know how it worked, but he ended up getting to do the funeral. In the process of doing the funeral, he learned that she actually had inherited a lot of paintings that were valuable and like a condo, a nice, luxurious condo and that she knew about it, and yet continued to find her little bags of whatever you put in those bags that you carry around and walk around homeless in the city. She had an inheritance. She just didn't receive it. Today, as I talk to dads in particular, this is applicable to any of us, okay? This is totally appropriate. You could say this any Sunday of the year. There is an inheritance for God's people that is there before us. The question is, will I receive it or not? Will I appropriate it and make it mine or not? Dads, we can't do our job well unless we do that. But it is possible to have that inheritance and know that that inheritance is available and still not receive it and live the life we're living simply, and for whatever reason, right? I mean, in her case, we don't really know exactly, except that she didn't want to leave whatever it is she had. And you might go, well, that was nothing that anybody would want. Well, think about the things you and I hang on to that aren't good, but they're comfortable because we're used to them. It feels safe. 
It's familiar. I don't know, and I'm afraid of the future. And when you're not in Christ, fear reigns in your heart. So it's really as obvious as it seems to us from the outside that she should have received and taken that inheritance and put it into her life and, and had shelter and had money to pay for everything she needed. We need to realize that not only was she blinded to that or unwilling or maybe unable to do anything about that, sometimes that's true for us. It's certainly true for us if we are not in Christ, if we are not resting in God's provision for eternal life and abundant life in His Son, Jesus Christ, then we're basically doing what she did. We see an inheritance, and we are not accepting it. Now, as we walk through what David is saying to Solomon, we're going to end with what God is saying in a vision to John, and it's going to basically give us a warning that God keeps His promises. And I say a warning because it depends on who you are, whether or not you want God to keep his promises or not. Okay, But in the meantime, what is David saying to Solomon? And he's re this is really straightforward. It doesn't need a lot of explanation. Let me just walk through it with you, and then we'll move to the last part. David says, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. In other words, I'm about to die. He said, so, three things. Be strong. Act like a man and observe what the Lord your God requires. And then he defines that. So let's, let's unpack these first two real quick. So be strong. When I think of strong, I think physically strong. But you and I know that that's not the only thing that we need to be strong in. And that's not the only place. Because think of all the ways we're weak. We're weak, not just physically. We're weak mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. At least potentially. All of those things are true. And the more I know myself, the more vulnerable and weak I feel in a lot of ways and how much I need God's strength in my life in those areas. So be strong is not saying, do, it's not, he's not telling him to do something he can't do. He's saying you need to nurture the things that you can do by cooperating with the Lord in all areas of your life, physical, financial, spiritual, emotional, and all, all the rest, mental, all the rest. Act like a man. Now that's a phrase, right? Act like a man. In that day, it would have very much felt like warrior, protector, provider, okay? But remember who David was before he became king and a warrior king, and a, he was also a musician. But what was he doing when they first gra grabbed him and said, come, we're going to anoint you king? <laughs> he was watching sheep. He was a shepherd. Now, shepherds didn't have a good reputation in the days of Jesus, but this is a thousand years before that. Shepherds were honored still at that point. And David was a shepherd boy, and with that came responsibility. And if you didn't take care of those sheep, your family lost money. So this was the family business, and he was given responsibility to do that and take care of that. All right? So when he says, act like a man, I think he's saying, act like a man in the best sense of the word, beyond just what that culture would have said. Because let's face it, a lot of things right. They didn't treat men and women the same, right? They had men here and women here. And they looked down on any, anybody that wasn't a man. And that's not the way God sees. He sees people in the image of God as equally valuable. So, so um, to act like a man, and this is, maybe this is a little bit of me reading between the lines and grabbing some New Testament and, and applying it here. But if I think shepherd, and that's the kind of king David was, he shepherded the nation. And I think, well, what's my nation? My nation, my tribe, my clan is the Gabriels. It's my kids, and, um, and then as they marry, that, that extends the family, but that's my tribe, and that's who I pour into. And today, you know, I'm going to get to spend time with them, and they're going to, you know, do the Father's Day thing for me and, and bless me in that way, but they, they give me the opportunity to be a blessing to them, and then they take that and go be a blessing to others, that I lean into these things. And that's a choice that we as men have. We as fathers, we have this choice to do this or not do this, to make this the priority or not. So, um, so what does a shepherd do? He leads, feeds, and protects the flock. Okay, A shepherd literally leads the flock to where the next pasture is. Okay, we've eaten all this grass and clover. Let's go find a new patch of grass that another shepherd hasn't already found. And on the way, let's find a, a creek or some water where we can get some water there. And I'm always paying attention to who's around. So we're going to lead, feed along the way. That's part of it. Feed them, water them, make sure they're getting all the nutrients and nourishment they need so that they can grow good wool and uh, 
uh, and, and be strong and uh, to be, do what sheep do. And then lead, feed, and protect. And that's watching for all the different predators that exist for sheep. Sheep are incredibly vulnerable. If they don't have a protector, they're just, they're just shark bait. I mean, they are just, just waiting to be eaten by something or taken down. The obvious predators, you think of wolves, right? And so the shepherd had his staff and his shepherd's crook, and he used whatever he needed to deal with those predators. But then there was also the kind of predator like the, the flies that would fly around the snout of a, of a sheep. And, and if they are able, they get inside the nostril and they lay their eggs. Yeah, that sounds really pleasant, doesn't it? And it's really bad for the sheep unless the shepherd does a good job of, of anointing the snout with the right kind of oil and, and just checking them out and making sure that they're healthy. And a loving, faithful cares for the sheep. Okay. So whether you're a king of a nation and you're caring for the people of your nation or you're a, a dad at home and you're caring for whoever's, whomever's under your roof, that's, that's shepherding, okay? And as, elder, as an elder in your church, that's the job of the elder spiritually. And if you go to 1 Peter 5, just read those first five verses. It describes in detail what elders, overseers, bishops, pastors, shepherds, however you want to name them, they're all interchangeable. That's what we're called to do. Lead, feed, and protect spiritually the flock that has been entrusted to us. And if your elders, I'm talking to you online too, if your elders aren't doing these things, then you need to pray and humbly confront that because that's their main job. I could go as far as saying that's their only job. Ministry of the Word, ministry of prayer, and then you have teams that come behind and make that possible by relieving them from many of the other duties that are often pressed on pastors and pastors. That's another sermon for another time. Okay, so let's finish that. He's going to describe exactly what this looks like. Act strong, act like, act, uh, be strong, act like a man, and then what's this last one? Um, observe what the Lord God requires. Okay, you need to take off your Western mindset, right? Our Platonic philosophy that has migrated with Western civilization that causes us to hear something and analyze it and rationalize it and observe it and do nothing. We need to think like a Hebrew. Middle Eastern mindset is to hear is to obey, and it's to act. It's not to explain away why I don't need to take out the garbage. It's humbly take out the garbage. Now, I'm not saying that they had it down and they were doing that well, but that was their mindset, very much their mindset. And so that, they're still disobedient, but it wasn't because they used this mental exercise of trying to figure out why I shouldn't do what I know I should do. They just were blatant and disobeyed. Read the Old Testament, and you get lots of examples of that. Okay? But we're no different. So walking in obedience is, to walk is, is to show motion. It's to say you don't just obey once. It's something that you do as you go. To walk, to live, to behave in that way. Act Okay, walk, observe what the Lord God requires. Walk in obedience to him. Ultimately, he is our authority. And if you believe that the Bible is true, then you believe that he is God and you are not, and that we are to walk in step with his leadership, not ours, and that we get a privilege to do that, and it's a responsibility not only to do that, but to lead those whom we influence to do the same. Walk in obedience to him. Then he's going to kind of say the same thing several different ways, and some of these will hit you differently than somebody next to you maybe because of the words but just these are just some things that came to mind as I was reading through it walk in obedience to him keep his decrees when I think of decrees I think of kings make decrees I declare that every Friday is ice cream day and it's free uh, to all who want it or, or and I also think of presidential um, executive orders which this is just presidents acting like kings instead of presidents but anyway I digress keep the, his decrees and commands I think military um, about face, and you do it, and that's your, you don't really just, you don't get to really think about it. You just do it, or there are going to be consequences. His laws and regulations, when I think of laws, I typically think of all the laws I break when I drive, and that's just not good. And then I think of regulations, I think of businesses, I think of banks and insurance companies and medical facilities, and all the rules and regulations and laws that they have to obey that change. And I think of the tax law and how it's that thick, and I just don't understand. But those are things that come to mind. And at the end of the day, as a Christian, I'm called to obey those. In my nation, I'm called to obey those. Submit gladly to the governing authorities, because God who put them into power. 
And unless I have a conscientious objection that's going to move me to act in such a way that I'm willing to pay the consequences by disobeying such law, and there are times and places for that, I'm going to, I need to obey those laws, or I'm disobeying not only the law of the land, but I'm disobeying God. All right, Romans 13, if you want to read more on that. Okay, let's keep going. So, as written in the law of Moses. Okay, what's the law of Moses? It's the law of God. It's the first five books of the Bible that God handed to Moses to hand to the nation that he was leading at the time, which was 500 years before David. So, 1500 B.C. Moses, 1000 B.C. David. Do this, and then he's going to tell us, here's why you do this. Solomon, David's saying, Solomon, Solomon, here's why you do this. So that, so that you may prosper, okay, succeed, be blessed, find favor, find success. Do this so that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you go. Now, this, is, this should be really encouraging, okay? This doesn't just say um, so that you may be a successful missionary, okay? It, it's whatever you do. Okay, so if you're home raising kids, you're going to be successful in home raising kids. If you're uh, in the medical profession and you're working in a hospital, then you're going to be successful there. If you're running a business, you're going to be successful there. The idea is that God is going to give you favor and help you do what you do really, really well, like supernaturally. Like people are going to go, I don't know what it is about you, but I just want you nearby because you know how to help us do, be successful in this business. And, it, and people see it. Look at the life of Joseph in the Old Testament, and you'll see an example of someone who did that. Okay, So um, prosper. And, and who doesn't want to prosper? Right? Who doesn't want to be blessed? Who doesn't want to be successful? But this is talking about success even beyond what the world would call success, success, which we tend to think of in financial terms. But this is success in your health. This is success in your, your mental frame of mind about all its, its perspective and living life in such a way that even when those things do, even when hurricanes do hit, that you're able to, to press through that with the right heart and mindset and still have the joy of the Lord in your heart, even though you may be really unhappy that you lost that that house or that car or that whatever in the process of the storm, okay? And then wherever you go, it doesn't matter if you're in the U.S., which is a very blessed country, or whether you're in North Korea, right? Nobody sign, there are very few people signing up for that actually know somebody that's wanting to go, and so keep praying for Rosalba. She wants to go to North Korea as a missionary, all right? Um, and so wherever you go, and then it says, then David makes this very specific personal statement. He says, uh, do this so that you may prosper in all that you do, wherever you go, Solomon, and that the Lord may keep his promise to me, David says. And this is the promise, he says, right there. If your descendants, David's descendants, watch how they live, if they walk faithfully before me with all their heart and soul, which is a summary of what we've just read, you will never fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel. Now, David was wanting to, he wanted to know that his son and his son and his son, they would all be in the line of David. This is what they call the Davidic dynasty. That's what he wants to see happen because God has promised him that, but it's a conditional promise. You know what a conditional promise means? It means if you do this, then the promise is fulfilled, and if you don't, then it won't. That's not how we do marriage, by the way. That sounds like a, that's a conditional promise. Okay, unconditional is, I'm going to give you this whether you do that or not. I want you to do that, but, okay, and marriage is, I'm going to love you and serve you, and I'm going to honor and respect you whether you do that for me or not. Okay, that's the marriage covenant, and that's the new covenant that Jesus brings, okay? David doesn't have that yet, but he does have, he, he has the, the forerunner to that. He has the covenant that we find in the Old Testament that is replaced by the new covenant is false Christ, Okay? So we understand and appreciate the new covenant by understanding and knowing the old covenant. That's why we study both the new and the Old Testament, one reason. Okay? So, let's land this plane. Uh, he, if you dads want to be successful, then he's giving you the formula. Here's how you do it. You walk with me. You trust and obey. You follow me. If you want to have that additional promise that David was talking about, no, you don't have a nation and you're not going to have you know, kids on the throne on down the line, but you're going to have a version of that, and it's called your, your family, your tribe, you know, right? It's your sons and daughters and their kids and their kids and their kids, and don't you want that to be 
a family and a tribe of, of prospering people? Don't you want that? Well, then, when you follow Christ, you can't just follow Christ. You've got to look back here and, and bring somebody with you. Okay? Your kids, grandkids, your nephews and nieces, and in some cases, your neighbor's kids because they don't have anybody leading them that way, or your students, or fill in the blank. You know who I'm talking about, right? For you, it might be totally a different kind of, but it, you get it, right? We follow Christ and lead others to do the same. That's what it means to make disciples who make disciples. That's 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. That's what it is. All right. Now, let's get to the warning. Revelation 14. Here we go. All right. A lot more angel action. We probably should have served angel food cake as a teaser, but um, we didn't go. We didn't think ahead. All right. Here we go. Starting in verse 14. Now, there's a lot of symbolism and there's a lot of... That, that's just the book of Revelation. For those of you that haven't been here... These symbols do a couple of things. One is they tell us what some, it helps us understand what something means using something that's easier for us to translate, whether we lived 2,000 years ago in A.D. 96 or whether we live today or 1,000 years from today, using symbols and things that happened before that, which we would find in the Old Testament Scriptures. That's why most of what you see, if not all of what you see in the book of Revelation, has already been said. It's already been written down, and it's somewhere in the first two-thirds of your Bible. Okay? And John, being a good Jew, understands this. So when he sees something, it's shorthand for him, and he can, just, he, he can remember it, he can write it down, because he already knows his Jewish Bible so well. He's going, oh, that's, oh, wow, that connects to that. Whoa, Daniel, and all the things that go with it. And he just he lays it out here. Okay, so let's let's walk through this. And I really there's two things I want you to see and then we're done. First thing is, well, there's two harvests that I want you to see. Okay, first harvest is the grain harvest. Think bagels, think donuts. Okay, bread, source of grain. And then the second one is grape harvest. All right, think wine or grape juice or something like that. Okay, those are the two harvests. Now, the principle in Scripture is that you reap what you sow, which is, a, a, we would say, you harvest what you plant. So we've got a lot of folks that like to do gardening, and they're doing some amazing gardening in their, in their yards these days, and it's really, really impressive what they're able to do. And I would fully expect that if they plant a tomato plant or tomato seeds right here, that they're fully expecting that plant to grow and bear tomatoes. That's what they expect. And if they plant tomatoes and they get carrots, they're going to be surprised by that. And probably, um, yeah, they're not going to be happy because tomatoes are better than carrots, at least last I heard. Okay, so um, when, we, when you take that and apply that spiritually, okay, the, the way that we live is basically we bear the fruit of whatever nature we're allowing to rule in our hearts. So if we're walking with the Lord, we're bearing the fruit of the Spirit. And if we're not walking with the Lord, then we're bearing the fruit of the flesh. Okay? And in Galatians 5, you can read the detailed description of both of those, and it's not pretty um, on one side, and it's beautiful on the other. All right? So the principle is that you and I will reap what we sow. So if I sow lies, if I live a life where I'm telling lies, I'm going to reap a lot of people that aren't going to be honest with me. God's going to make sure that, that, that well, he won't have to. It's, a, it's like a law. So if I... If I walk up and stand on top of this building, walk to the edge and jump, the law of gravity is going to take care of the rest. God doesn't have to step in and do that, right? Well, the law of sowing and reaping is the same way. All spiritual principles are the same way. He, God doesn't have to make them happen. They happen because he set them up that way. He designed it to happen that way. So when I, um, if I sow violent, if I'm violent, if I have a violent temper and I have violent tendencies, then the people in my life are going to respond in kind. I'm going to reap or harvest what I've been planting, especially when you think about being that way around your kids, and then your kids grow up, and then what do they do? They do what you did. Okay? So I could use lots of examples. You understand, right? We reap what we sow. So that means we should be reevaluating our lives constantly in light of the fact of who God is. And if I understand who God is and what he's like, his character, his, his glory, then 
I understand who I am because he saved me. I'm part of that family now. So my behavior, my mindset should reflect his. Because he's sowing that into my life. So I should reap, he should reap from me a life of righteousness. If he is teaching me to be right by walking rightly with him, act justly, love mercy, walk humbly, then that's the fruit he should find in my life. Because the Spirit of God lives in me and he's empowering me to do that. Okay? And if I'm not walking with him, then he's going to get the fruit of the flesh, the fruit of a life that is totally bent against God. It's not really super complicated to understand. As long as you understand that God does a work in our hearts that makes us able to bear the fruit of righteousness or not, the fruit of the Holy Spirit or not. And that's Jesus taking control. It's you saying, I surrender all to Jesus. It's you saying, he's the king. And the dynasty he wants to lead is uh, generations of Christ followers. Okay? So let's, let's keep reading. Let me show you how this plays out. I looked, and there before me, so John is writing. He's seeing the vision. He's writing it down. I, John, looked, and there before me was a white cloud. Okay? I don't think he's talking about toilet tissue. I think this is a picture of a white cloud. And seated on the cloud was one like a son of man. Okay, now that phrase, son of man, like a son of man, is found in Daniel 7, okay, which was written hundreds of years before this. Six, seven, eight hundred years before this. Okay, uh, no, not quite that far. Say 600 years. Around the time of uh, Nebuchadnezzar and after. Okay, Daniel would have written the book of Daniel. And he would have referred to, been referring to the Holy, uh, I'm sorry, the Messiah, Jesus. He's referring to, and that was Jesus' favorite way of calling, you know, who are you, son of man? He would call himself the son of man above more than anything else. So, and we could get into this more, but that's my take, okay? And so I would say take that with a grain of salt. But that's what I think this is mean. This is like a son of man, meaning he is the Messiah. And then he says he's got a crown of gold on his head, which represents authority and power. And he's got a sickle which represents a harvest is, is imminent, okay? Something has been planted, and now we're going to harvest. That can be a good harvest or a bad harvest. We'll get into that in a second. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe, okay? Now, if you're a farmer, you know that when it's time to harvest, you can't play. You've got to get in the fields and get the harvest out of the fields so it doesn't spoil, if you harvest it too soon, it's not ripe. But once it's ripe, it's all hands on deck. We've got to harvest this, get it to market, and sell it as soon as possible to get the maximum yield from the crop. Okay? Now, this is symbolic. Okay? Now, I had one little problem with this for, for a few minutes, thinking, well, if this is the Son of Man and this is the Messiah, this is Jesus, then how does this angel get off telling Jesus what to do? I had a little issue with that, but I think I've solved that. Okay, what is an angel? Angel means messenger. That's what messengers do. They get messengers from God, and they take them to whomever he sends those messages to. So what I think is happening here is for our benefit, because they don't really need this to happen, God the Father sends a messenger to God the Son, Jesus the Lion who is the Lamb, the Lamb who was slain but is standing and alive by heavenly throne, Revelation 4. And he's saying, it's time. Now, remember, there's two Greek words for time, chronos, which is like, what time is it? And then there's kairos, which is there's a moment in time that is more significant than others. The time has come. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. Mark 1.15, kairos moment. We talk about that when we talk about the kairos circle. This is a different time when it's used, and it's used several times. If you look back over the Gospels, you'll see Jesus use that phrase a lot. It's time. And basically what he's saying is there's certain things that are going to happen in history, past history and future history, things that are going to happen, and they're waiting for the appropriate time. And God is over time. He, he's outside of time. So obviously he can orchestrate all of that, and he does. And this is just another example of that. So he's sending the angel to tell Jesus it's time to harvest. I know you knew that, Jesus, but I'm telling you for the benefit all those people are going to read. So just bear with me. Don't get an attitude. It's all good. All right. So Jesus is good. So now I'm good. So then he... He does what the angel says. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Again, symbol, symbolism. I don't know that he's up there with a, like, you know, a wooden handle and a sharp blade, and he's you know, swinging it around. He, he harvests, okay? He's God. He can, do it, he can do it with a word. 
right? If you can create a universe with word, then you can do any of these things with a word. So who is harvested? Because it's a who that's harvested, not an it. We're talking about wheat. We're talking about people who know the Lord. So what is he doing? He is gathering the remaining people on earth who know and trust him. I don't care when the rapture happens. If you want to say, well, was this before the rapture or after? Is this mid, pre, post, uh, no, uh, none? It doesn't matter. Whoever's left on earth that knows and trusts the Lord is being rescued by Jesus right here and now. Okay? Second harvest. Great harvest. More, more to it. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Still another angel who had charge of the fire came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him. Now, before I start, who's that angel? The altar has fire under it. And if you remember back, I don't remember what chapter, 8, 7, there was an angel that took coals from the censer and threw them on the earth, and it created all kinds of havoc. So this is, I don't know, some people think this is the same angel. But the point is, this angel's telling that angel, from the altar, so he's from a place of, this is a, a spiritual reality, and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, take your sharp sickle, gather the crust clusters of grapes from the earth's vine, because its grapes are ripe. So once again, we have ripe produce, and so therefore it is now time to harvest. Now, who is being harvested here? Now, there's differing opinions. Shocker, right? All right, so I'm going to give you both opinions, and I'm going to tell you I think that they're both true, okay? I could be wrong. It could be neither. I don't know, but this is what, and I'll tell you why. So first of all, note, a vine. Jesus said in John 15, I am the vine, and you are the branches, okay? So that, and Israel is often referred to, God's people are often referred to as a vine or a vineyard. So that makes me think these are people who are righteous. But when you read on, you start to go, I'm not so sure. And the angel swung his sickle on the earth. He gathered his grapes and threw them into the great wine press of God's wrath. Oh my, I hope that's not where I'm going to end up because that doesn't sound good at all. What in the world is a wine press? So back in the days of Jesus and further back than that, they used to carve out of the rock an area like, I don't really know how to describe it, kind of like you would dig a hole in the ground, except they would do it in something really hard, and they would sweep it out really clean, and they would harvest the grapes, which would be, you know, like, imagine a pickup truck load of grapes, and you'd put them in a bunch at a time, and somebody's just doing this the whole time, stomping the grapes. And so you can imagine, you know, it's like grape juice squirting everywhere, all over their body, they're just turning red, their toes are red, and it's kind of, you're kind of going, I'm not drinking that. And they're just going to town, squirt. And then at the side of this wine press, designed to just do that, among other things, there's a trough that slopes out of that into where you can put a barrel or something to capture the juice, because that's the goal. Capture the juice, because that's future wine. So that's future money. That's future wine. Okay? You get what I'm saying? This is, this is valuable stuff we're doing. So they go in all this trouble so they can make wine and, and whatever other things they use from, from that produce. But wine is a big deal. Remember we talked about last week, and, and you've seen this in Scripture lots, that wine is often used to represent God's wrath. Wine is symbolic of blood. So this is starting to really sound messy if you start to see that as imagery. Well, it gets grosser. Here we go. Verse 19, 20. They, so the angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered his grapes, and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. They were trampled, those who were harvested, were trampled in the winepress outside the city. Jesus died on the cross outside the city. Blood flowed out of the wine press or out of the press, rising as high as the horse's bridles. That's the part that goes around the horse's head, I think. I think I got that right. It's about four or five feet off the ground, depending on the, the horse. For a distance of 1,600 stadia, which is about 180 miles, which was the, the length of Israel in that day. That's just gross. I'm just saying. That's, and that sounds horrible, right? 
because it's supposed to be, because it's the wrath of God. And we've read earlier in this chapter that God's full fury, he's like holding nothing back when we're talking about this. So you're like, okay, who are we talking about? I need to know right away because I've got to do something about this, right? Well, if you are not in Christ, then this sounds very much like this is, the, this is another way to describe your future, not in Christ. Okay? And I don't disagree with that. This is where those who don't want to have anything to do with God end up. They're saying, you may say you're my creator, but I don't know and I don't care. I'm living as if I'm God of my life because I don't know you. You can't prove to me you exist. And that's just their attitude. And they resist and they rebel. They don't want to know anything about God. And God says, well, I'm going to give you what you're wanting, which is not me. And that's a real, that ends up in a real place called hell. Okay? And I don't want right? I don't want that. I don't even like to talk about that. And, and Now, there's another take on this passage that I think is equally valid, and I'm not sure that they both can't be true. Still see the cross outside of the town. Jesus died, shed his blood. There's a lot of blood language about Jesus and the cross, right? We sing about nothing but the blood of Jesus, right? We talk about that as because Jesus died. Blood is attached to life and death, okay? And then when I see all this blood, I go, well, it's all, where's the blood? It's all in Israel. It's covering Israel. It's covering Israel and all those adopted in. So we all deserve this wrath. Let's just be clear. I deserve this wrath. I deserve nothing but the wrath of God because of the way I have lived in my head, in my words, in my life. And that's just yesterday, <laughs> okay? We all deserve the wrath of God. And in one sense, that's for us. But God didn't leave that alone. God is just and he will punish sin, but God also made a way of mercy, a way for us to receive forgiveness. And so he shed more blood from someone who didn't deserve, and that's his son, who lived the life we couldn't live, and died the death we deserved to die, so we could live the life we didn't deserve for him. And so I, I kind of like the way somebody said it, that blood, there's so much blood. And it's like saying, you know what? There's so much blood so that you can't say there's not enough for me. I need the blood of Jesus to cover me. And if you go back and you study the Old Testament tabernacle and then the temple and you see the, the blood that is shaken and splattered all over the mercy seat, and it's like, gross, why do they keep doing that? It's because it's the blood that covers us. It's the innocent blood of Jesus Christ that covers you and me and makes it possible for you and me to be forgiven for all that we've said, thought, and done in all of history and in even the future. And I am banking on that. So when we have the Lord's Supper, we're remembering the body broken, the torture that led up to the cross, but the bloodshed that killed him so that he could be our substitute to receive the wrath of God on our behalf. So when I see this, I see I deserve that, and I see a way out. And the way out is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for me on the cross. I know that's a lot. I know that's heavy. I know that's messy. But let's not, let's not be so squirmish that we miss it. Dads, this is the inheritance that we have. It's messy because sin is wicked. And it takes the life of an innocent person, the infinite son of God, to erase the effects of sin in our lives. Nothing less than the blood of Jesus can cleanse us from our sins. It washes us white as snow, Isaiah 118. But we can't do that apart from what Je the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, Jesus Christ. So if you want to be the dad who walks in the words, ways, and works of Jesus, enjoying the benefits of that new covenant, even though it's conditional, embrace the unconditional covenant that is found right here. Embrace it. And recognize that Jesus died for you so that you could show your kids the way to a prosperous life. Not an easy life, not a trouble-free life, 
and not necessarily prosperous in the way the world would describe. Better than that. Okay? But it's, it's us responding in faith. So there's a Peanuts cartoon. You know, Snoopy, Charlie Brown. Charlie Brown's sitting in his beanbag chair watching TV. Sally walks in. I never really liked Sally. Sally's his sister, and she walks in, and she says, I learned Bible verse. For, I don't know my verse for church. He goes, oh, yeah, what's that? And she goes, well, I don't remember now. You made me forget. And he's like, she's like, maybe it was something from the law of Moses, or maybe it was from the book of reevaluation. And I thought, you know, and it's like, oh, that's, that's really good, actually. Think about it. Guys, are we reevaluating life in light of the culture? That's not bad. If we reevaluating life in light of our family situation, not bad. Are we reevaluating life in light of eternity, though? Because that's essential. Everything else in life pales in comparison to that. You want to be a dad? That, uh, that makes Jesus smile? I was about to say, you want to be a dad that leaves a good legacy. I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not playing that game anymore. That's a worldly motivation. I'm not going there. I don't want to, what is the song? I don't want to leave a legacy. I, I want it to be about Jesus, not about me. That's hard. That's a temptation I struggle with. But it's not about me. They're going to forget us anyway. Remember Ecclesiastes? Everybody's going to forget you. They're going to forget Billy Graham. They're already trying to erase George Washington, right? It's going to happen. But don't you want to have lived a life that is so impactful that even though people will forget you, if they were to trace back your family, they would find you in the shadow of Jesus? Now that, that's awesome. Let's pray. God, I thank you. I thank you for Father's Day because it, it gives us a chance to really think from that perspective. And we get so busy, we quickly, we quickly get consumed with what's urgent and we lose what's important in the process. Lord, I pray that you would help us reevaluate. I pray that you would help us reevaluate the inheritance that is in front of us, that we would acquire it by grace through faith in Jesus Christ even if we have to do it again, because maybe we've lost sight of that. God, you call us to believe in your gospel because it's good news, and you call us to do it over and over and over again. And so, Lord, I pray that even now, you would just pour out your grace and mercy in the hearts and minds of those that are here today, especially the dads, the future dads, granddads, the moms who are being having to be dads, the adoptive dads, the foster dads, the grandparents raising their kids, and all the rest, all the categories, God. Pour out your grace and mercy on them. Help them to recognize that apart from you, we really can't do it. We really need you to do it in and through us. Lord, if there's someone here that doesn't know you, someone online is watching and listening, they don't know, Lord, help them understand that you are ready for them to repent and believe the good news that you're near, that you're here, and that by believing that you've made a way for us to get back to you through forgiveness, through the blood of Christ, that we can be saved and made like Jesus. I pray that we would just ask you to do that in our hearts right now. God, do this work in me right now. And that by believing, have life in your name. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.